They say history is doomed to repeat itself. Well, psychologically speaking, uh, we learned our self-worth, we learned how to love ourselves, we learned about love in general when we were very young. Uh, if we had um, an alcoholic parent, drug addict parent, narcissistic parent, abusive parent, absent parent, then we're learning about love in a dysfunctional way. And then we wonder why our current lives are chaotic and painful. Well, it's not us. It's the way we were formed. It's the way we were taught to um, relate to people and to ourselves. There's a clinical term uh, to describe the habits of people with uh, cluster B personality disorders. It's called future faking. Now, it's not just that um, the cluster B folks, narcissistic mothers in particular, that's who I'm thinking of, uh, it's not just that they lie, it's that they lie with a purpose. They lie because they are trying to create a, um, a false self for the public, uh, a grandiose, you know, omnipotent, perfect projection of who they wish they were. And because they fall short of that in actuality, because nobody's omniscient and perfect, especially these uh, grandiose uh, borderlines and narcissists, because they fall short of that, they have great shame. And so there's that, uh, what's called um, the grandiosity gap. So that gap between their false persona and who they actually are causes shame and they react to that. So um, don't dare complain that they didn't keep a promise to you or point out any inconsistency in who they say they are and what they actually are and do. You will be destroyed. You will, they will shoot lasers out of their eyes at you and you will disintegrate. I'm not trying to be funny. If you have caused them narcissistic injury, woe be unto you. Oh, woe be unto you. You will be devalued, smeared, scapegoated, made fun of, backstabbed, and most likely discarded. But when we're talking about a parent, it's not as easy to discard us because, you know, we're children, we're humans. But they can make us invisible. My mother likes to tell the story about how she brought me home from the hospital and she held me in her arms. And she said, that she would do everything in her power to always make me happy. She reminded me of this, oh, she still reminds me of this. Oh, when I brought you home from the, when I brought you home from the hospital, Lise, I promised I would do my best to always make you happy. So this way, if I had any other emotion besides happiness and glee, I was, de I was disappointing her, hurting her, uh, making her feel inadequate, uh, turning her into a promise breaker, and that was cause for her to cry. So I was not allowed to have my emotions. And later on in life, uh, depression. I don't know where I went wrong. I always promised to make you happy. I did my best to make you happy. No, you didn't do your best to make me happy, Mom. But you can't tell her that. That would cause her narcissistic injury. I'm already causing her narcissistic injury by being less than thrilled with life, having any kind of negative emotion. So you have to understand, we're not real people. We are extensions of them or, or just cardboard cutouts for them to, to, to uh, reflect themselves off of. Or we are audience members. Now, I was the perfect audience member until I started to develop my own little moods and personality. You know, I was mommy's little darling, and 
she could show me off and I was completely dependent on her and so that you know made her um, happy if you can call that happiness I promised always to make you happy I tried my best so so she turns my pain into her event well she turns everything into her event whether it was my accomplishments oh well I taught you how to read when you were four She's never seen me teach. You know, I'm a professor. I'm sitting in my classroom. Look at all the gifts behind me from students. You would think they would mean something to me. They do. They do. I love them. I love everything. Look, this one. She writes, um, to Professor Lisa, simply a great preacher. <laughs> it's a Muslim girl. And, but she still, she just loved my, uh, my very uh, passionate sermon style lectures. They don't land all these gifts and compliments. They don't. I'm always waiting for the other shoe to drop. I take pictures of things. Is this real? Will it last? Do I matter? You know, in self-worth uh, lessons, they teach us that no matter what people say to you or about you, you have worth. And although that's true, and it's and you should develop a, a healthy self-worth outside of other people's opinions, if we didn't get the initial opinions and validation and reflections and eye contact and to be affirmed that we exist and that we matter and that our emotions matter and that our feelings matter at a very young age if we didn't get held if our emotions weren't uh, treated like they were real then we, we go through our adult life and, 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 and early in you know our teen years just just looking for validation and how do we get that well you know um Hanging with popular kids or hanging with anybody who, not even popular kids, anybody who, who will hang with us, uh, anyone who will make us feel approved of. Any compliment we get, any any kind of flattery, whether it's sincere or not, you know, we, we latch onto it, we want to hold it. Why? Oh, I matter? I matter? You mean it? People who, who give us praise, sincere, even sincere praise. Now, false praise is pretty dangerous. It's usually... Uh, someone trying to manipulate us, but even sincere praise is like, really? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Do you mean it? And if somebody, God forbid, tries to, to stay with us long term, well, we're going to sabotage that because that can't be real. And, and we're waiting, <laughs> we're waiting for the, for the big um, pain of, of loss, the fear of loss, the fear of uh, losing someone's uh, approval and love and so we make it happen so that we can have uh, that feeling of control I remember always being told how things were and but the words didn't match how I felt and the words didn't match my experience of it you know hey hearing my mother tell me how much she loved me and how hard she was working to make me happy but her behavior was so invalidating and dismissive and even to this day I can't talk about my accomplishments without her trying to take credit for them or dismiss them or, or devalue them like I said I teach I'm a public speaker I believe I'm very good at what I do and I'm told I'm really good at what I do I uh, I'm good at being in front of a room. All that attention. <laughs> it's a, it's a never-ending um, need. It's a bottomless pit. What do I say? It's like the Grand Canyon, and you're trying to throw, you know, a frozen peas into the Grand Canyon one at a time to try to fill it up. You just can't. She's never seen me speak. Never. Uh, now, there was one graduation ceremony where I gave a speech. Um, and her, what would her reaction be? 
Oh, well, you know, I gave the, uh, you know, Mommy used to give talks. Remember I used to give talks about animal welfare? And uh, I sang it my eighth grade, whatever, whatever. It would, it's like, well, why are you saying that now? What does that have to do with me and, and now? It's, she doesn't even get it. Her brain doesn't function that way. And you would think, oh, well, so who cares what this old woman thinks? Well, when the old woman's your mother. That's where you wanted to get the validation so early in life and never got it. And then just, you just keep hitting that and hitting it and hitting it and hitting it and not getting it. You keep pressing that water fountain button and no water comes out. But it should because 